to, that people sort of shy away from conflict, but conflict is really easy to manage. Let's talk a bit about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cameron from Smooth Digital and welcome to Tea with Toby, the show where we ask and answer the questions playing in the minds of the care sector's business leaders. This episode is sponsored by Every Life Technologies and we're going to thank Google for letting us use their podcasting studio. So let's kick off the show with a few words from our marketing strategy director, Toby Ali Usman. Thank you, Cameron. So for those of you that are new to the show, at Smooth Digital, our aim is to maximize the ability for both care homes and home care businesses to provide the very best care in their communities. Now, in order to do that, you need to grow. But we know there are challenges when it comes to growth, and we want this to be the podcast you listen to where we can discuss challenges, you can listen to growth-focused conversations, and also get tips that you can implement into your business right away. Now, with that said, we've got the lady who is raising the bar in care, Sue Jones, with us today. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, before we get into the questions from Toby, Sue, could you just tell us a bit of a background uh, to yourself and your expertise in the care sector? Okay, thank you. I'm Sue Jones and our company is Raisin Bar and Care and we're brand new so we set up the business on the 19th of December 2019. It's myself, Helen Butler and Tina Chapman. In terms of background, I've actually run my own consultancy business, Thoughts Become Things, for uh, over 18 months now. And prior to that, I worked at Home Instead as a business performance manager for three years. And in that time, I supported over 30 franchise offices, uh, really helping them to grow their business in terms of um, business growth, obviously, uh, and helping them with the day-to-day -day running of the business and really looking into the detail of how they could be better businesses, which was great experience. Prior to that, I actually spent 19 years in financial services, and there I spent a lot of time transitioning financial services businesses because there was a, a massive transition going within the financial services industry. So that's my background. Brilliant. So Toby, take it away. So in Tea with Toby fashion, we're going to jump straight in. And the first question I've got for you is, what does a great care business look like? Okay, um, for me, with the care businesses that I've seen, there's two distinct different types, if you like. So what I see for great businesses is that they actually really look at their business as a whole. So right from the outset, they've actually been very clear on their company structure. So they, they, they've got the, the, the component parts set in stone, if you like. So you've got the managing director, the financial director, the operations director, and the sales and marketing director. Now, if you're a small business, you think to yourself, I'm never gonna, I'm never going to be able to implement that within my business, it's just me. And, and that really doesn't matter. It's really thinking about the long term. So how are you going to be a great business in the long term? And that's really what great businesses do right from the outset. They really look at that, look at the structure, look at the way that the business is run, and really set that in stone. Um, in, in other words, in other ways, that you know, that they, the the one thing that I see that care businesses do day in day out is they get caught up in the small areas within the business. So that could be things like they're struggling with uh, small margins, so small profit margins. So how do they how do they cope with that? How do they get out of that? It may be they're struggling with some sort of process failure. So that's why they call us, because something's gone wrong. That could be medication, it could be compliance, it could be CQC registration, whatever, but some sort of process has failed. And the other area is employee issues. And this actually results, you know, they're all little problems, but eventually they, they end up being one massive big issue. And this is, this, the, the result of it is because they haven't gone through and set up that corporate structure right at the beginning. So that's what great businesses do right from the outset. They don't get caught up in the drama of the, the business. They look at it from um, a helicopter viewpoint. Mm. So 
there might be a, a care business that you're listening to us right now thinking, you know what, actually, that sounds a little bit like me. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm mm-hmm. answering the phone. Where do, what kind of steps do they take to begin with to start implementing this sort of structure? The one book I would recommend, and I, I loved, uh, Simon and I recommended the E-Myth, absolutely recommend that book as well. Uh, the other book I would absolutely recommend is The Four Disciplines of Execution. All right. Mm-hmm. Because The Four Disciplines of Execution actually talks about the whirlwind and the reason why the whirlwind prevents you from being a great business. And it, it really gives you some practical steps to go through to stop you concentrating on the whirlwind, separating that out, and concentrating on the business. Mm. So business growth, business processes, business profitability, any issues that you've got, it just allows you to separate that out and gives you a structure to follow. So if someone, for example, took that structure, there needs to be a finance director, yeah. uh, so sales and marketing, and then operations. Yes. So let's say there was a sole owner and they had to wear all three of those hats. How should they think about it? What I would do is go through, there is something called a racy chart that we used at Home Is Dead, and racy charts are, are you know, they're all over the place. Mm-hmm. If you just t- type in racy chart, so that's R-A-S-C-I mm-hmm. chart, if you type that into Google, it will come up with a, a basically a structure of tasks that you actually go through. And what I would do for any new business, doesn't matter whether it's a care business, any business out there, what you should be do is re- doing is writing down the tasks that you actually do on a day-to-day basis. And what I would do then, and what good businesses do, understand, good business owners understand that they can actually delegate the tasks that they don't enjoy doing or they don't have time to do. So once they, once you've done that, you can say, right, okay, once you can afford to, sales and marketing is a great example. Mm-hmm. So everybody, you understand that you need to have sales and marketing as a business in order to grow your business, in order to become successful and, and famous in your own location. So if there is sales and marketing, um, to be done, then you need to delegate that. If you haven't got time to do that, you need to delegate it out. So how are you going to do that? Who's actually going to do that for you? And uh, unfortunately, some of the, some of the, some people do that, but they don't actually follow that up and really give that person who's supposed to be doing the sales and marketing targets, KPIs, and they really don't understand what their objective is, so that can fail. Mm-hmm. So it's not only delegating, it's not abdicating. Okay. So you are still accountable for your business, but you are delegating the tasks to a person who is capable of doing those tasks. Mm. Now, just earlier, you touched on three problem areas, which mm. probably sound super familiar. So was it process failure, um, employee issues, and... Profitability. Profitability. Mm. So. Is that, is that usually the areas where people fall down or they reach out for you? Definitely. So things like um, attracting private clients. Mm, so one. that is, you know, that's a key issue for people at the moment. UKHCA has just released the, the, you know, the minimum yeah. uh, charge out rates that should be in place across the UK. And really, I, I feel it should be more than that if you mm. are going to make a good profit within a, within a care business. So there's lots of businesses still out there doing council contracts. I believe there's a massive market out there for for clients, for private clients. Mm. So it's understanding, okay, if you want increased profitability and you want want your business to grow and you want to be able to attract the clients that you like dealing with, then you need to invest in order to be able to attract those private clients. And that means becoming attractive to the people who are your potential clients out there. Mm. So you've got to have a great website. It doesn't cost a lot to have a great yeah. website. So you've got to look like you are, you know, you are attractive to your potential clients. You've got to look, you know, you you really got to tell something about yourself on your websites, thinking about your culture, your values, what you stand for. Those are key areas that you need to, to look at in terms of attracting private clients so you just touched on culture and values Mm. now a care business you would think that they spend quite a bit of time on this Mm. what has your experience been with the sort of businesses that you work with 
and you know, there's so many. There is so many aspects of that. Mm. That little sentence there, yeah. because the majority of people that I work with really care about their clients. What they don't necessarily do is understand how important their why is. So, and, and people think it's a very personal thing, understanding your why, so they don't realize that they actually have to share that because you actually mm -hmm. have to be a really great leader within a care business. You've got a lot of people working within it, so you need to be able to lead from the front. So that's why it's really important to look at your why um, looking at your culture and values, your why actually is very linked to your, your core values. So what are your core values? What do you stand for? And if you, if you tell people what your core values are, that actually builds into the, the structure, the company structure, it builds into the whole strategy of what you're trying to create for the business. Mm. So, and then the employee issues. Mm. That's probably a huge one that most people face. Absolutely, and if you did that that previous step, you would mm. solve the majority of your employee issues. Mm. Because if you have happy employees, you won't have a problem. And if you want happy employees, you have to have culture and values in place, you have to be a great place to work. And that doesn't mean about giving people lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not why people get up and go to work. People go to work because they want to feel like they belong. They want to have, a, a, they want to feel like they're empowered to do the job. They want to feel like they're trusted to do the job. So there is, but that is very much down to each individual leader of a business to actually transcend their core values, their culture and values, their why into that business and making people aware of it across the board. So every person in that business should be should be living the core values of the business. So let's say, for example, people listening right now, they're thinking, look, we want to grow, and it's always better to learn from other people's mistakes. Now, in your past, with all the care businesses you've worked with, are there any common challenges that they have which prevent growth? I, you know, I think the most common challenge that I've had is either you get a, a, an ineffective leader in some sort of capacity. So ineffective leader could be the owner of the business, it could be the registered manager of the business. But either of those two areas can absolutely, there is no chance that your business can grow if you have either of those. So it's owning up to the fact if you are ineffective or if you have people that are ineffective within your business and absolutely without doubt the most people most people in care do not like conflict so the problem is is that they have these ineffective people within the business and they in addition to that they don't deal with it so that in itself causes a problem calls a problem yeah. And, and you know, it's easy, it, it, conflict, it, it, people sort of shy away from conflict, but conflict is really easy to manage. Let's talk a bit about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are some people who, you know, when it comes to conflict, it's like they'll prefer to send an email or Absolutely. they just don't want to experience it. Absolutely. And you know what? Again, I'm going back to the core values. Mm. If, you, if you have your core values and somebody within the organisation does not adhere to those core values, that's a really easy conversation. Yeah. Because you're not talking about anything personal. You're, not, you're just saying, look, these are our core values as a business. We're, we're signed up to these. These are what we agree that we've all, this is what we, this is what we are. So that, if that person is then ineffective or is not adhering to those core values in some way, shape or form, and you can link the tasks and the activities that they've done back to the core values, that is a much easier conversation. Now, I, I, am, I shy away from conflict. I don't like conflict. I am not a conflict person. If you look at disk profiling, you've got, uh, I'm not going to go into it now, but basically you've got four, pe four types of people within the psychometric profile. And the majority of people in, in care are S's, which means they are team players, they, 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 um, you know, they, they share a lot of love, um, they're nice people to deal with, they're caring, they're compassionate, but they don't like conflict. 
It's not that they can't learn the skills yeah. to have conflict, they're just not naturally aware that they, that they naturally avoid conflict. So coming back onto one of the things you mentioned, which is poor profit margins. Yes. What's your, we've had some conversations separately, what's your philosophy around price that people charge? Um, and how they should look at it? Uh, do you know what, I, I think, that for me, I mean, I'm 53, and I, I'm the next person in care, the next person, the next generation, or certainly the, the next to that generation, and my standards and what my expectations are going to be so much higher than the, the now. Mm -hmm. But I, I absolutely believe that the expectations of care is changing. At the moment, we've got this time and task, but we are now moving into well-being, mm -hmm. really looking at what else can we actually provide for those clients. So it's well-being, it's nutrition, it's so much more than delivering medication or personal care or home health, it's so much more than that. So how can you design and, and make it valuable because you, everybody wants to retire or be looked after and cared for properly at a point where they need it. So, I mean, there's a massive thing on social isolation. What can you do in terms of benefiting those people within social isolation? Does anybody talk about the well-being of those people, the mental well-being of those people that need care, is that discussed? You know, are you having conversations on a day-to-day -day basis with your clients? That's what I would say to care businesses. Are you having those conversations and are you actually giving them the service that they need to help them with that? Because that's where it's going. And, it, and I can probably imagine some care businesses currently do a little bit more than what they're paid for, Absolutely. but they just don't charge for it. No. And, and you know, you think of all, I mean, you talk about the, the care package solutions that's, that's completely different out there, and that's something that I'm working with clients on, is, you know, you do so many tasks that you're, absolutely, that you're not, um, or people don't think that you're, they're charging for. So it's things like um, liaising with third parties. So people like doctors, healthcare workers, etc. cetera, um, they're not charging for that. Family support. You know, if you're doing any sort of end of life care or if you've got clients with dementia, there is generally a lot of support that's given to the families yeah. that's not included currently within the hour of care. So that needs to be included. Um, it's things like supporting them with dementia training. You know, how do those family members understand how to deal with that person with dementia? What can they expect in the long term? You know, what can they do to help their lives or live them? enable them to live independently. Toby, we really need private paying clients into our care business. We don't understand the world of digital technology, digital marketing. What should we do? Look, that's the question we get a lot from businesses within the community. So what we've done, we've put together an ebook called the Care Growth Blueprint, which is a step-by-step -step guide on the marketing steps you need to put in place to attract private paying clients into your business. So. Download the ebook. The link should be in the description below and enjoy the rest of the show. So let's talk a bit about the different stages of business because there are some people who are starting up, they're small businesses, some people who are big. But what about the transition between someone who's a sort of family business going on to that next level? What sort of things should they be thinking about at that stage? So th this is just a natural evolution of a business and it's something that, you know, when you start your business up, you've probably got um, th two or three people within it maximum, you've probably got some care professionals working for you uh, and a few clients and, and that feels, you know, everybody's getting involved in the day to day, everybody's answering the phone, everybody's mucking in and it feels like a nice, small, friendly place to work and when you're growing, when you go to the next stage, that's a really hard transition to make because all of a sudden you have to start putting systems and processes in place and really think about what you're doing next. So it's putting KPIs in place, key, key performance indicators for staff, and then all of a sudden there, there can be tensions at this point. Uh, and the reason, and it's also really hard for business owners because they, they, they really 
don't want to let go. They find it hard to trust people with their business because their business is their baby. Mm. It's like one of the, the family members, you know, it, it's really close to them. So they find it hard to trust people. But unfortunately, in order to transition, you've got to let go and you've got to trust people. And you've got to let people make their own mistakes. As long as you have op operate an open and honest culture without blame, people will generally learn from those mistakes and move forward. And there may be, at some of that stage, you know, going from one stage to another, it may be people are just not, not gonna come with you on part of that journey, mm -hmm. and it's accepting that. Sometimes, you know, especially with the registered manager, if you've got somebody at that beginning phase, quite often they, they find it hard to transition to the next level, but they absolutely can sometimes find it really hard to transition to a larger business because it's a completely different set of rules, if you like. So those, yeah, it's really hard, but it's being conscious, okay, I'm now transitioning as a business, what do I need to do? Mm. Just to clarify though, so earlier you were talking about having your core values, having your why, mm. does that then need to change as you change? I would say absolutely not. The, the only difference that I would say is that when you're small, you uh, everybody's aware of your core values or should be aware of your core values. But as new people come into the business, they're not going to know what your core, core values are. So it's really important is how can you actually implement your core values into a, a bigger business that you're mm -hmm. transitioning to. And that's about working that into appraisals, into team events, so they understand what their core values, they should be living and breathing those core values. Yeah. And that's, if you can do that from the small business to the medium business, and you can implement those core values at that stage, you've absolutely sorted it. So for anyone who wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to contact you? If you go on to raisingthebar.co.uk, that's our brand new website. We are going to be at the care show at the NEC in March, so we've got to stand there. And we're also going to be in London as well in September. And are you on social media at all? We are on social media. <laughs> which, which platform, which are the preferred platforms? We've got LinkedIn, LinkedIn. and we've got Facebook. Okay, Brian.